All right, joining me once again here on The Matthew Filipovich Show is my good friend Bryce Covert. Bryce is a writer for The Nation magazine and the economic policy editor at Think Progress, all of which you can find at BryceCovert.com. You can also follow her on Twitter at Bryce Covert. Bryce, thank you so much for being on the show again. Thanks for having me on. All right, so Bryce, last week, the Republicans unveiled their budget proposal, and if it's passed uh, and signed into law, it does some very, very cruel things towards the poor. Tell us all about it. So the budget, I have to say, doesn't look a whole lot different than um, what Paul Ryan proposed for three years when he was running the budget committee, uh, which is to say that most of the spending cuts, the budget promises $5.5 trillion in cuts to spending. Um, most of these are going to come from programs that help the poor. The Center for on Budget and Policy Priorities estimates that about two-thirds of those cuts are going to come from programs that help the less well-off. One of the more notable ways that it does this is um, through block granting, which is a very boring-sounding term, um, but is a pretty devastating but sort of backhanded way to cut anti-poverty programs. Um, When we reformed welfare in the 1990s, it was block granted. And what that means is that the government basically hands a pot of money to the state that usually doesn't increase. Usually it's just a money, a, an amount of money that just then gets set and then loses its value to inflation over the years and says to the state, you know, um, you can have more freedom to run these programs, but at the same time you also have to figure out how to enact these cuts because it basically comes down to a cut. So the House budget would block grant both food stamps and Medicaid, the health insurance program for the poor, both of which would end up drastically cutting these programs and cutting millions of people off from those supports. Well, what's what's what you write about at Think Progress is how, and again, this is sort of this this thing that Republicans always embrace. And and frankly, you know, I to be fair, uh, the block grant thing was signed into law by Bill Clinton, so some centrist Democrats embrace this kind of thing too. I mean, he did sign it into law when he reformed welfare. Is this this sort of magical fallacy that oh, if only the states had the 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 power to actually decide how to spend this money better, everything would be so much better and things would be so much more efficient. You actually write that that when it comes to um, other programs that have been block granted, it really has not been a good deal. And it's actually, the, the situation has gotten worse in pretty much all cases. Right. It, it, the idea of block granting, and the House budget comes out and says this, is basically states are right now somehow prohibited from unleashing this vast reserve of innovation they have, <laughs> where they would be able to take less money, but still serve people the same or more who are low income. And what we've seen with welfare, for example, is that's just not the case. Um, the program currently reaches just 26% of the people who are eligible. That's down from about three quarters of the people who were reached in the 1990s. It just doesn't um, help as many people as it used to. And I think that's because the idea that states have some sort of, you know, like magical ideas that are going to fix these programs is just fantasy. Um, right now, <laughs> if they do have ideas for changes, they can ask for a waiver, and most of those waivers are granted so that they can experiment. But, you know, states uh, are sometimes the laboratories of our democracy, but in this case, I don't think they have any plans that would just really dramatically change these programs with less funding in a way that doesn't hurt poor people. Well, you also write that there. It's pretty much uh, there's other programs other than welfare. I mean, obviously, welfare is like the big example of it, where you can kind of look. Uh, but you actually wrote that other pretty much every other program with block grants over the over the last decades, pretty much eight, eight out of eleven of them have actually shrunk. Exactly. Yeah, of the eleven major block grant programs that we've created, eight have shrunk, and not just that, but they've shrunk dramatically. Um, a lot of them by 60%, one of them by over 100%. Uh, what The reason that they're shrinking is often because, like I said, these the way these block grants work is the federal government gives states a fixed amount of money. They don't increase spending if a need goes up, say, you know, as for example, we have a recession where more people are going to need to rely on the safety net. That funding stays the same. At the same time, 
it's very unlikely that lawmakers are going to come in and give states more money, even if inflation is eroding the value of what they gave them in past years. So states are basically given less and less money to try and serve more and more people as the population grows. Yeah, and I, you know, but like, I guess to, to be fair, probably you know the economy. That we're never going to have another economic crash. You know, the, I, I think we're just going to go keep keep going straight up. We're you know we're we're you know we've made, we've turned that corner and nothing but but you know streets of gold for here on out for every American man, woman, and child. Oh yeah, no no more recessions ever again. I mean, and look, yeah. the thing with SNAP too, SNAP being food stamps. You know, they the budget folks sort of say, oh well. Um, enrollment is still high. We need to bring enrollment and food stamps down. We need to put people back to work. The reason that food stamp enrollment has been so high has been because of the economy and the recession. When it took a nosedive and people were unemployed and losing income, people needed to still buy food and they turned to the food stamp program. And that is actually starting to come down at the, now that the recovery is kicking in more for people, you know, unemployment is down. Um, and it's it's projected to keep doing that if we just leave it alone and mm-hmm. sort of let it uh, equalize out as the economy recovers. But if you go in right now and start hacking away at it, you will end up kicking people off who need that assistance. Well, another thing that you and I, I know we've talked about before on the show is another reason I think that, you know, in addition to just the, the recession, people needing to actually eat during the recession and actually survive and not, not starve to death and have their children starve to death. Um, another reason food stamps are, are you know, uh, is up is because the jobs that people get, they can't actually, are, are low wage jobs. Most of the jobs that have come back you know, since the recession, the majority are like low wage uh, jobs that people actually need further assistance, even though they may be working full time. Right. I mean, not to uh, pick on Walmart because we know that it did just announce a minimum wage increase of among its own employees, but Walmart has notoriously paid low wages. It's, those are the kinds of jobs that we've been adding since the recovery began. And there are studies that have looked at Walmart workers that show that a lot of them rely on public benefits to get by, even if they have a job. So the idea that people somehow need to be helped back to work goes against the fact that a lot of people who are on food stamps do have a job. And there are also work requirements built into a lot of these programs. So we already try to encourage work through the programs as they are. So I don't, I think this idea that, you know, oh, well, what they need is a job, not a handout, which you hear all the time. I yeah. think people have a job and still need a handout. Basically, they still need some help to be able to put food on the table. <laughs> 